The Bike Karma Bicycle Stories podcast is brought to you with support from The Frame and Wheel, helping you turn your cycling items into cash without the hassle. And AD Bikes, the modern face of Ostra Daimler bicycles. Become bike, become AD Bikes. Episode 70. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Bike Karma Bicycle and Cycling Stories podcast. I'm your host, Tom Brown. The mission of the show is to bring bicycle-loving people from around the world together briefly through sharing really good bicycle and cycling stories. It doesn't matter if you're a beginner or expert. These are no-drop stories. Just like no-drop rides, we're never going to leave you behind with name-dropping and technical stuff that we don't explain. So the person who's just taken up the bike again after 30-year hiatus can listen right alongside with somebody who's been racing for the last 30 years. This time, how many bikes do you have to fix in order to call yourself a bicycle mechanic? How many hours do you need to spend on the trails before you call yourself a mountain biker? We listen to one person's journey and how she came to think of herself as a cyclist. And then that same person tells us how she came up with an idea for a museum bicycle exhibit that would be interesting for someone five years old and interesting for somebody 100 years old and everybody in between. You have a lot of podcasts you could be listening to, and I really I've seen appreciate you coming along with me for the bikes, ride on mine. But recently, let's roll I went out. to the Connecticut Historical Society and saw some really rare ones. Katie Heidsieck and the other people at the Connecticut Historical Society put together an historical, interactive game exhibit incorporating every facet of cycling and then connecting it right back to Connecticut history. The bikes on display there are the definition of museum quality. While you might see something like these bikes, I think you'd be hard pressed to find them in such living like condition. So this story comes in two parts. First, we hear Katie's story about how she gradually came to identify herself as a cyclist, starting here in the States, moving over to Germany, and then moving back to the United States and becoming a museum curator. Then there's the story of the exhibit itself. If you are in Connecticut or New England or anywhere even remotely close, if you're an advocate of bicycles and cycling culture, this exhibit needs to be on your radar and on your list of places to visit before the exhibit closes later this fall. Whether you do mountain biking, road biking, gravel, like the Darwin of bicycles, you could come explore the common ancestry of all these different bicycle genres. Look closely at some of these bikes and you will feel a connection to the endless river of bicycle evolution. Now let's listen to Katie as she describes her personal evolution as a cyclist. When I look back on my evolution to becoming a cyclist, I start to see moments where I formed this relationship with my bicycle and with cycling. And one of those moments is definitely in Germany. When we moved there, one of the very first things at the top of the to-do list was get a bike. My husband is German and he said, we're not gonna make it here without bicycles. We need to do this first. He picked out a bicycle for me. I didn't know anything about a bike as a commuting tool. He brings it home and it is this huge clunky bicycle. I could not lift it. I didn't know how it worked. It had these this funky light system. It had a weird locking system. It was it was pretty overwhelming. It was kind of a metaphor for moving abroad, really. It was a lot to learn and I didn't know how I was going to figure it all out. Piece by piece, I kind of discovered what all the elements are for. You have the little light that you push over so it connects with the wheels, so that when you're pedaling, your light just comes on when it's dark. And the locking mechanism that's so handy, you can just pull out your little key, leave your bike there, it's gonna be there when you come back. All these little features that at the beginning, I don't know what this does, I don't know how I'm going to use this. They just kind of fell into place and it became this tool that I was really intimately familiar with. And then it really became my comfort zone. I knew how to get on my bike and use my bike to get around town. And that was my way of exploring. Once I was on my bike, I didn't have to pull out my fledgling German. I didn't have to try and interact with people in situations I wasn't yet comfortable in. I could just kind of ride my bike around and that became my tool to exploring my new home. Do you remember 
remember what type of bike it was. It was a Dutch style bike. They call them Hollanda Prad, but I don't remember more than that. Do you miss it? Yes. My relationship with my Dutch bike in Germany is different than my relationship with my Brompton here in Connecticut, which also sounds funny to me as I say it, but it's really true. That bike gave me so much of what I needed at the time. And this bike was purchased and put into use with a lot more confidence. I knew what I was doing and I was trying to, in some ways, recreate some of what I had left back in Germany. It was all much more familiar, although riding a bike in here in Connecticut actually feels a lot more challenging in many ways. So in Germany, the life was challenging and the cycling was the easy part. And here, cycling is the challenge and the, the lifestyle context feels easier. I'm Katie Heidseek. I'm an exhibit developer at the Connecticut Historical Society and, as it turns out, also a cyclist. You realized that you were a cyclist late. How did you come about realizing that you were a cyclist? I've been around bicycles since before I can remember. My dad was a cycling enthusiast. I have always had a bicycle. I remember getting a bicycle when I was young and getting to pick the colors. It was a hand-me-down from my brother, so we spray painted it. I went for pink and purple, naturally, and I was so excited because it was my custom bike. I rode that for a long time. I had a mountain bike eventually. It was a Trek. I remember picking that one out at the store had a bike all through adulthood when I moved to Germany. I got a nice Dutch bike. It weighed a million pounds, but was extremely robust. Would take me anywhere. Had all the easy parking mechanism and the little lock in the back wheel. All the nice features for a commuter bike. Now I ride a Brompton. I have about a four mile round trip commute to work. It's great for my little folding bike. And all through these bicycles, I never once thought of myself as a cyclist. My husband is a cyclist. He has a road bike. He puts on the tiny bib shorts and goes out for his rides, but I didn't do that, so I just didn't identify that way. The picture of who was a cyclist was extremely clear in my mind. They were definitely wearing Lycra. They were, they were in a hurry. They had a very fancy, very lightweight bike. They were pulling it out specifically to go for a ride, and that ride had no multi-purpose to it. It was just to get on your bike and go fast and then be done. And then this epiphany happened to you. Oh, I think there are as many types of bicyclists as there are people who have bicycles. I think that each person's relationship with their bike becomes a unique kind of cycling. I primarily cycle for commuting purposes and sometimes for fun on the weekends. And that's my own blend of cycling that I don't think necessarily belongs to anybody else I might ride with. And it really wasn't until I was working on this exhibition at the Historical Society about bicycles I was meeting with my team, sharing the different information that we had, and I realized, you know what, I know a lot about bicycles. <laughs> and even more than that, I like riding bicycles. Maybe I am a cyclist. I think before I saw the bicycle as originally a toy, it was something I did for fun and pulled it out, played with it, and then I put it away. And then later in life, I think it became a tool. It was a way for me to get around, particularly when we were living in Germany, we didn't have a car. That was the easiest way for me to get to and from the train station to get to work. And so it was just a method of transportation. It wasn't until I realized that simply being on a bike, enjoying your time on a bike is enough to call yourself a cyclist that I was like, you know what? I, I do have this relationship with the bike. It actually, it brings me joy. I use it to get around and that's actually a really unique thing to do, especially here in the States. I realized it was kind of part of who I was. 
do you look back and say to yourself, I should have known? It is funny to look back now and think about there is no one right weight. And this is very obvious in other areas of our lives. I'm also a runner. I have always identified as a runner. I don't run particularly fast, but I just knew I was a runner. And for some reason that didn't translate into cycling. And so I think that there is a tendency to put these labels on different activities that we do and different benchmarks of what we can achieve. All you have to do to identify with something is enjoy it and participate in it. That's what I would want to tell somebody who is questioning whether or not they were a cyclist is, do you have a good time with it? Is it something you enjoy doing? There you go. You're a cyclist. Welcome to the Mid-Roll Gratitudes, where I take a moment to give thanks to our allies and supporters, contributors, listeners, and you for joining me on the show. This is a grassroots show. My day job is as a science teacher. I do not have the backing of any giant media company, and I have a staff that's mostly composed of animals. So if you would like to help out the little guy in a sea of sharks and corporations, there's many low cost and even free things that you could do to help the show. One of those things is to leave a positive review absolutely anywhere. If you use the phrase bicycle podcast and or cycling podcast in that review, even better. But you can listen to the show just about anywhere from YouTube to Audible, but we're hosted at this place called Podbean. Any place that you follow us helps, but especially there it helps to raise us in the search rankings. So a big thank you for following there too. Ricky McH, thank you for following on Podbean. Michelle Anderson, M Mills 2001, Fixibjikli, thank you. And J Bakak PNG, thank you very much for following on Podbean. Since the last episode, a lot of people have asked for a free sticker pack. This is our attempt to be honest in our advertising and organic in that it gets to people who actually might be interested in it. All you got to do is email me at bikekarmaguy at gmail.com and then responsibly share those stickers around. If there's a place on your bike trails or your travels that has a lot of stickers there, adding a Bike Karma sticker will be just the thing that gets people to say, hey, what the heck's that? It's crazy how many people have found the show this way. So sneaking one onto your friend's water bottle, good move. Putting one on the back of a police car, not as good. Unless you're the police officer driving it, in which case, okay. Putting it on a fence post where nobody's going to seem to mind? Great idea. Thank you. Putting it on the cow standing next to the fence post? Please don't. The cow's already a listener. So thank you to everyone in our responsible sticker army. I'd also like to thank my town for continuing with the Bicycles on Main springtime celebration. Now for the third year, every May, we decorate bikes. This year, I think it's over 60, and we set them up along our historic Main Street. It's a celebration of spring and each other. You can see everything there from a Loch Ness-type monster built out of bicycle parts, to a Salvador Dali bike, to the Red Onion Queen. Giant bees, a hockey bike, and a tiger who rode his bike to go fishing. This is all May, every May, hopefully in Wethersfield, Connecticut. So I appreciate everybody in town who picked up this idea and ran with it. Bicycle fun isn't over though when we get to the end of May. On Sunday, June 11th, we have the Weathersfield Bicycle Festival Show and Swap Meet. It's our 10th year. We usually have over a dozen sellers and hundreds of bicycles around Hamner School in Weathersfield, Connecticut. It's always on the second Sunday of June from 8 in the morning until 12 noon-ish. Interested sellers should show up at 7 with $25, which goes to the Weathersfield Bicycle Club, the high school club that I advise. It's our annual fundraiser for that. And the venue opens to the general public at 8 a.m. You can walk around with a bike and try and trade it. You can just look. You can play scavenger hunt games. If you have a bike you're particularly proud of, you can bring it and enter it into the show. We're going to have some folks there to help you to register your bike on Bike Index for free. You might remember them from a few episodes back. They are who you turn to after your bike is stolen. Registering there.
there makes your bike a little harder to sell and a lot easier to get back to you if it is in fact found. Our friends up in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, the home of Ivor Johnson Bikes from back in the day, are having a swap meet the weekend before ours, Sunday, June 4th. Check out Fitchburg Rides for that information. Also on June 17th, there's going to be a Providence Bike Jumble, essentially a bicycle swap meet, but search up Bicycle Jumble Providence. And then looking just a little far ahead, September 24th is the return of the Builder's Ball, a bicycle trade show which will be in Simsbury, Connecticut. So thanks for all the people doing that stuff. And then finally for this month, a big thank you to my supporters on Patreon. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help support the cost of the show. Just go to patreon.com and search up Bike Karma. Thank you. The Midrolls usually gives a big thanks to longtime show supporter Fred Thomas. Fred is a cycling enthusiast extraordinaire. He owns a few bicycle endeavors, one of which is the frame and wheel, helping you to sell your used and new bicycle gear, bicycles, accessories, parts, taking all the hassle away to give you more time, space, and cash. But as a former racer, Fred also learned one day that his beloved brand, 80 Bikes, the brand that he used to race on was up for sale. So Fred resurrected the brand and brought it back to life. Keeping the styles of the old with the technology of the new, 80 bikes are a stylish nod to the past while looking forward. The Kai Steel Limited Frame is an excellent choice for any gravel rider who needs a durable and versatile platform for competition, off-season training, or adventure cycling. The frame is really versatile. Made out of Columbus steel tubes, Paragon Machine Works through axle dropouts, flat-mounted disc brakes, and made in the USA. This head-turning bike will get you noticed, and it will also serve your needs very well. And the best thing about AD bikes is that you can build them up exactly the way you want. Fred is happy to walk you through the process, or just take your directions down and make it perfect. Go check them out at AD Bikes, the modern face of Austro Daimler bicycles. Now back to the show. After getting to know a little bit more about her relationship with the bicycle, we turned our attention to the exhibit that she helped to create called The Bicycle Game. If you had to sum up the exhibit in just a couple of sentences, what would the exhibit be like? The Bicycle Game is an interactive, playable exhibition, hopefully unlike anything you're used to experiencing in a museum. We invite visitors to come into the galleries and play the 25 different games in an attempt to defeat Barnabas Boggs, a villain from the 1890s who was very unsuccessful in his bicycle inventions and has taken revenge by encoding all of our content into puzzles and games, and that's what you need to do as a visitor is come and solve those puzzles and games. We're at the Hartford Historical Society Museum and Library, and what's the connection with Hartford? I, I've opened up bikes before and seen Hartford stamped on the parts, but for people who aren't from here, what's our connection in Hartford, Connecticut with the bicycle world? The history of bicycles really is a Connecticut story. Albert Pope started one of the largest bicycle manufacturing companies here in Hartford. That was Pope Manufacturing Company, and they made Columbia brand bicycles. He was one of the largest producers of bicycles in the 1880s and 90s. That all happened here in Hartford. The city had a number of velodromes and cycling clubs. A lot of the infrastructure that was developed for bicycles, the roads and whatnot, those went on to form the American Automobile Association and the Federal Highway Administration and literally paved the way for cars. And that's all rooted in the history that happened here in Hartford, Connecticut. When we come into the museum, we start off with a story. The story is that this guy, Barnabas, has done some bad stuff. He's trying to change the history of the bicycle. to you live from the studio where we have breaking news. 
We have confirmed recent reports of an attempt to erase the history of the bicycle. Karen, what can you tell us about this situation? That's right, Scott. Connecticut's premier culture and history museum was rolling out an exhibition about bicycle history, but they've had to hit the brakes. Barnabas Boggs, an inventor from the year 1899, has apparently traveled through time and changed all of the exhibition's information into puzzles and games. You could say he created a very roundabout way to learn this history. Wow, what got this rolling? Well, Barnabas Boggs was responsible for a few bicycle inventions in the 1890s that didn't quite revolutionize things. Square wheels, a wooden chain, and he's still bitter about his lack of success. We believe this is why he's trying to backpedal and erase the 1890s bicycle craze from the historical record. That does sound serious, really serious. Visitors can help recover bicycle history by playing games and solving puzzles at the museum. Our organization has provided instructions for play and scorecards for tracking progress. Each player will collect points as they play the games. These points can then be used at the end of their visit to spin the extraordinary wheel. The outcome of those spins can help repair bicycle history. That's good information, Kara. It sounds like it's time to... Gear up! And play the bicycle game! <laughs> So now we'll make our way through this beautiful building. And the building itself has a bicycle connection as well. The building does have a bicycle connection. Curtis Veter was an inventor in the late 19th century. He invented, among other things, a leather bicycle seat and the cyclometer. The cyclometer is a revolutions counting machine that could tell you how far you've gone on any wheeled device. That was wildly successful, and he went on to form a very successful company and build this house that is now the Connecticut Historical Society. And he must have done very well because this house is gorgeous. It is, outfitted with all the latest and greatest of the time, including an elevator and a car wash in the basement. Wow. Anyone who's ever found a cyclometer on a bicycle Maybe it was an old one in a parent's garage or a grandparent's garage. Maybe you got a bike at a yard sale that had a cyclometer on it. They're not that impressive from the modern perspective. But if we travel back in time, the Veter cyclometer was the Garmin of its day. Before Strava, before Garmin GPS units, people were just as persnickety about keeping track of their distance and how fast they went as they are today. But they didn't have the tools to measure that. So back in 1896, you could buy a cyclometer. It's a little thing if you put your thumb with your pointer finger and you make a circle with it like the okay. If you do that, that's about the size of it. It was just a little clockwork odometer for a bicycle wheel. You could get it gold plated. It was kind of a bling item. Or you could get it in a silver nickel plated. But you could get the gold plated one for $5 back in 1896. That would be the equivalent of $180 today. Not that far off the mark between comparing a cyclometer back then to a Garmin GPS unit today. Obviously, top of the range Garmin is going to be more, but you get what I mean. So I'm walking through this mansion that has become a museum, just thinking to myself, that little cyclometer thing. Yeah, I was really thinking that crappy little cyclometer odometer. Really? This house from that? That little thing made such an impact that this guy made so much bank, he had this amazing house with a car wash inside. To be clear, he didn't invent the wheel, he didn't invent handlebars, he invented a little tiny thing that measures how far you went. And he's living in a mansion like a king in Hartford, Connecticut. Now true, that wasn't the only thing that he ended up making, but just to go to this museum and see this amazing place based on that one invention, that being the Kickstarter, that in and of itself is an amazing story. This was a hot item, and for him to make that much money with this item, cycling had to be really popular. Some revisionist would have you think that bicycling is just kind of popular, kind of for weirdos, off to the side, maybe in Europe. But when you go to see this exhibit, The Bicycle Game, and you look into the history of Hartford, Connecticut, USA, the bicycle was in the forefront of the modern lifestyle back then moving forward. 
Let me read you some ad copy from the Times. If we go back to 1896, the cyclist without a Vitor cyclometer is almost as much at sea as the ship without a log. It gives accurate information of distance traveled that is always useful and often of vital importance besides the constant satisfaction that every writer finds in reading the exact record of his, doesn't say his or hers, his cycling achievements. This little invention was such a leap forward that they and copies like them were still being used right up through the next century. It wasn't until the mid-70s and 80s that more modern odometers finally eclipsed the Vitor cyclometer. I took one off of an old 60s touring bike, and in doing the prep for this story, I looked on eBay. I should go check that out. I should go see where I threw that into because they were very durable. And as people got new bikes, they would just put the old cyclometer onto them. You didn't need to upgrade it as much as you do with modern tech. Anyway, just another reason to go check out the bicycle game. Heading up the ornate staircase, we were confronted with a giant Wheel of Fortune looking device. <laughs> All right, what did we win? We got two watts. What does that mean? The watts that we generate here by playing the bicycle game are going to help us defeat Barnabas Boggs. We need a lot of watts to generate enough energy to shift the probability field and bring back bicycle history. So you got quantum physics involved too. We do. Let's go check out the exhibit. This is the part that I got the most excited about so far. We are looking at Mark Twain's bicycle. That's right, the actual bicycle owned and ridden by Mark Twain. So when he did the famous quote, which was, Get a bicycle. You will not regret it if you live. This was the bike that he had lived to be able to say that about. You're exactly right. This was the bicycle that he tried and as he wrote about it, failed many, many times to get up on. He did eventually figure it out, but it seems like it didn't stick. He didn't hold on to this bicycle for very long. It does say not to touch, but you there's no cage, there's no glass, so you can literally get your head right up next to it. You can see the numbers. He rode a 52 inch wheel, which is the number of inches that that big giant wheel in front was. And man, type of handlebars he used, everything. That's so cool. I'm glad you noticed that, Tom, because that's exactly what we want visitors to do in this space is really develop a relationship with the objects that we have on display. Get close, look at them closely and find out what stories they have to tell you. Yeah, it's a nice balance of not touching, but also feeling like it's almost just as good as touching. Yeah. In some of our other episodes, we talked about how the bicycle at first was really a rich man's game, and it was pretty much just for rich guys who could afford it back in the day. And then all of a sudden, it turns out to be, Susan B. Anthony calls it the most liberating thing to ever happen to the women's movement. What are we looking at here? We are looking at the evolution of women's clothing and some cycling specific clothing for women. When the bicycle was that one giant wheel, women had a, a physical limitation with the outfits that they were wearing for being able to ride the bike anywhere. It wasn't until you get the safety bicycle with the two smaller wheels that women's clothing <laughs> permitted them to ride the new shape of the bicycle. And so this game here, which is a set of tiles that you have to put in chronological order, trying to put women's footwear in order from oldest to newest cycling footwear, helps tell that story of how women adapted to cycling and cycling adapted to a whole new audience of riders. All right, let's play. All right, so we put these up here like this. Yes, exactly. All right. Okay. Whew. Now, some of them are pretty easy. I'm going to put this one over here. Excellent. Um, and then I'm going to go to this one, which looks 
maybe like the 20s or 30s. That's right. And then, then we get a little bit more tricky because we've got the cage, which I know came first, but then we've got two different styles of clipped in petals. Oof. Uh, I'm gonna guess that maybe I might be wrong because I'm not familiar with that type of clip there, but. I, You're very close. Oh, you know, I got to flip the this first one. Time. Okay, yes. yeah. So the SPDs <laughs> are the last ones, right. Shimano's, okay. Yep. yep, and the two fun stories about this, the shoes here on the end, those are my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Brought in for their photo shoot. Women did not have women-specific cycling clothing and footwear until the 1980s. So these first set of images that you see, these are all footwear that were designed for men and women wore them because that's what was available to them. Even though it was a huge breakthrough with the pantaloons and the bloomers, right? It wasn't, didn't get the shoes until exactly. way after. Exactly, and even those bloomers were a pretty gutsy thing to wear. They were out there, but most women were not, not quite fond of being ridiculed as they put them on and rode around. And so they really didn't have that wide of a reach for quite some time. Okay. And then once again, we have the exhibit right there. You can get your right up close to it. Look at the details, feel like you're there. Just great. Some photo ops, more games. I don't want to give it all away, but there's a writing. And then we've got well, somebody, that one's behind a glass because somebody's going to steal that for a tweed ride, right? <laughs> I mean, I would like to wear that outfit. So I mean, we it, do know how in demand that fashion would be. It is very, yes, this would be very sought after by many people. You'd have your own Barnabas type thief trying to come in and change. <laughs> exactly. Who gets that outfit? <laughs> So here's a big, giant factory building. What is it and where, oh, well, there's the Hartford Capitol. What are we looking at? We are looking at a painting of downtown Hartford and the foreground is the Billings and Spencer Company factory. This is on display because of the bicycles that you can see in the painting. They are not the subject of this painting. They were just so commonplace at the time that this work was done that they you see them on the street, you see them leaning against lampposts, you see people holding on to them while they chat with other people. And it really illustrates how bicycles were everywhere in the late 1800s. When people complain that bicycles are kind of an anomaly that should it gets in the way of cars, it's the opposite. It's the other way around. Exactly. Some people argue that we wouldn't have cars were it not for the bicycle. The bicycle really put the idea in people's minds of a personalized mode of transportation. And that was the ideological leap to the automobile. And so much of the infrastructure that we now think of as being car infrastructure was originally built for bicycles. Good history. This, we're looking at a wall-sized picture of downtown Hartford, and it's full of people riding penny farthings. It is. We have people in various states of riding penny farthings, both successfully and non-successfully. These bike parades were a common way to show off your cycling skills when people were still figuring out these crazy newfangled machines. We provide the opportunity to climb up on one, a reproduction, don't worry, no actual bicycles were harmed in the making of this photo op, but you can climb up on a high wheel and see how you would have looked riding down the street in Hartford. Nice. I'm looking at a bike that's just geeking me out. I see it's got the pegs on the front fork to put your feet, so it probably doesn't have a freewheel. You need to put your feet up if you go too fast and you lose your footing on the pedals. But apart from that, can you tell me all about it? 
Yeah, so you're looking at a Hartford safety bicycle. The neat story behind this bicycle is that it was made by the Pope Manufacturing Company, but it was actually made and produced under the Hartford Cycles name. And Albert Pope did this very deliberately because his competition was selling bicycles more cheaply than he could sell his Columbia bikes. He didn't want to reduce the quality of the Columbia bike, so his workaround was to start the Hartford Cycle Company and sell a cheaper bike that was both manufactured more cheaply and sold more cheaply without tarnishing the Columbia bicycle name. This bicycle is from the early 1890s. 1890 to 1890. There's obviously a lot here for kids to do. There's lots of games and stuff, but as an adult with fully grown kids now, I would come just to see these bikes. These are not the normal bikes that you would see every day at a bicycle show or something. These are kind of rare animals and you learn a lot about bicycle design. How many bikes do you have total? We have five historic bicycles on display and one contemporary bicycle, several other bicycles in our collection, several other particularly from Albert Pope and the Columbia brand. Wow, it's amazing to look at some of the lines. If you focus on one part of the bike, it looks almost modern in like this part right here. It's got the sleekness of like a newer carbon fork, but then you look at the front and you see these curves of this and the it's down to is just a rod you know it's it's an amazing it's amazing to look at that design and just see the connections between how we got from that big wheel thing to this to today absolutely one of the things that i found most fascinating was that by the end of the 1890s the bicycle looks essentially like it does today you start in the early 1800s with the Velocipede, which looks quite different. It's powered by your own foot power on the ground, pushing it forward. In about 30 to 40 years, you have the safety bicycle. All we've done since then is tweak it. Like this has reminded me of a mountain bike design that's fairly desirable now, able to put belt drives on them mm -hmm. because the chainstays aren't getting in the way. And this has that elevated chainstay. Yep. So it's like, wow. Well, it's that cool. was um, one of Albert Pope's big obsessions was the chainless bicycle. He had made a chainless bicycle. It was just too expensive to sell to most people. And so he couldn't find a market for it. But he believed that that was going to be the future. And he kept on working on it even after it stopped being an obvious, profitable choice. <laughs> We're walking into a room with three bikes. All are very different designs. I could stay in this room for an hour. It's And it's comfortable in here as we're walking around too. It's not rushed and I feel like I can hang out with these historical bikes, which is kind of nice. That's great. That's the, exactly the idea of this exhibition is that you can come in and have whatever experience you want. You can play one of the games. You can play all 25 of the games. You can spend all of your time in room space where we are looking at the three historic bicycles that show you the evolution of cycling from about 1860 to 1880. Tell us about this velocipede. Yeah, this is an example of a very early velocipede. These were the bicycles that were really human powered. You had to push your feet along the ground to make the two wheels spin. Then you could bring them up and rest them on something that looks like a pedal, but this is before the gear drive had been invented, so the only way to power it was to use your own leg power. It's got a couple pedals in the front, but those are kind of like a big wheel. It's kind of like riding a big wheel around it, and the spokes are just solid metal. It's more like a wagon wheel. Around the outside, it's just a strip of iron. Yes, it was a very rudimentary and very heavy design. Wow. So this isn't a reproduction. This is a you're right. This is an actual bike from 1869. It has been restored, but it is original. And you can see how people would, how it would last. Like you could probably, I mean, 
I'm not going to ask you, but you could probably go ride this in the parking lot right now. It definitely looks like it would hold up. I don't think it would be a very comfortable ride, but I think it would be very robust. That's part of what the love of the bicycles is about, is that they do have such a longevity that these early bikes are so beefy that you could retrofit them a little bit as new advances came out. You know, maybe swap this out or swap that out or put a more comfortable seat on, but they dialed it in so early that it really is an amazing invention. Absolutely. That reminds me of the thought exercise of were bicycles invented or discovered because so many of the elements seem so basic. It does seem to fit together so naturally that it almost seems like the concept must have existed somewhere for us to just stumble upon. All my stuff, I've never heard it said like that before. So thank you very much. Was the bicycle invented or discovered? I love that. And how about this one? We've got another high wheeler. Yes, we are looking at the bicycle alternatively known as a high wheel, an ordinary, or a penny farthing. This has the giant front wheel with the little tiny back wheel. And that was the way, without a gear drive, that was the idea for how to get a bicycle going faster to build this really large wheel. This is the bike that is really said to be for athletically inclined men. You had to be had to have a certain level of mental and physical ability, I think, to think that you could conquer this machine here. And then this one looks almost like you could see it being ridden in a tweed ride. Exactly. Now we're in 1890 and we're looking at a Columbia Model 46 safety bicycle. This is the bicycle that, as you said, looks like something we might be riding around today. It's not that different in form and structure from our bicycles. We do a whole show about head badges and how head badges are meaningful. This just looks like a brag. The head badge is a list of patents. These are all the patents for all the components that make up this bicycle. What Columbia Bicycles doesn't tell you is how many of these patents Albert Pope had to beg, borrow, or steal to become a part of his operation. And that's part of the story that they can get here as well. Exactly. So one of the goals for this exhibition was that visitors would laugh, exclaim, and think out loud. And it has been wonderful to wander through the galleries and hear that happening. We had a couple, maybe both in their 70s, who were here arguing over whether or not the man had correctly identified one of the parts that was transferred from the bicycle to the automobile. He thought he had. It wasn't exactly the language in the answer key, and so his wife was trying to convince him he was not eligible for those points. <laughs> People get competitive. The exhibit is really for all ages. Kids are going to have a great time here. They are natural players and know exactly what to do in this space, but it's also, as you said, for teenagers and adults as well. There's beautiful bikes to admire. There's challenging games to play. There's really something for everyone. This story of innovation and bicycles in Connecticut is something that keeps on coming up in the stories that we tell. So by all means, I see us having more bikes on display in the future. Our website is chs.org and you can find information about visiting our site. We also have our collections database. We have parts of our collections database online there. So you can search the database, look for bicycles, bicycle parts. Those sorts of things that have been digitized can be found on our site. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at CT Historical and on Facebook at CT Historical Society. Awesome. Thanks. This wonderful exhibit is only on display through September 17th, 2023. So head on over to number one Elizabeth Street in Hartford, Connecticut. And please consider showing them some support for bringing bicycle history into the light, the Connecticut Historical Society. Either give them a visit or follow them on social media. Thanks.
Hello, hello. This is Seven from sunny California, and I run the Sprocket Bike Marketplace app. I'm here to give you your ABC quick check. So the first thing I want you to do is squeeze those tires and see how firm they feel. Then pump them up anyway. I've broken the kneecap over this. There is no reason you should have the same happen to you. Next, check those brakes. Squeeze on the brake levers and push the bike forward. Then squeeze on them again and push it backwards. Make sure there's no funny business going on there. C. Check the chain, the crank, cogs, basically the whole drivetrain, and make sure everything is in full working order. For the quick, is the quick release check. Go over all your quick releases on your brakes, on your wheels, and anywhere else you might have them, and make sure they're nice and snug, make sure they're in their closed position, and make sure absolutely under no circumstances are there no parts of them missing. And anyway, after that, uh, before you roll, just Get on the bike and start off slow. Be attentive to sounds, pay attention to the way the bike feels and rides, and stop and look again at your bike if anything feels off. This has been the ABC Quick Check. Thanks for taking a listen. Enjoy the podcast. Off you go. You've made it to the end of another episode of the Bike Karma Bicycle Stories podcast. I really appreciate you coming along with me for the ride this time. As usual, I'd like to give a big thank you to Keller Glass and the band Mob Jack for giving us permission to use their songs for our opening and closing theme music. You can go check them out at mobjackmusic.com or kellerglass.com to see what he's up to these days. All the other music was royalty-free, attribute-free, and even though those artists put their music out there in the universe for people to use without credit, I'd still love to give them a big thank you for that. Sharing your musical craft like that with the world is extremely helpful for independent producers like myself, so thank you to those independent artists as well. I want to give a big thank you to all the people with stories waiting in the queue. If you have a story that you think might be good on the show, be it epic or cute, be it short or long, if it's an interesting story about bicycles, I'd love to talk to you about it. Just go to www.bikekarmapodcast.com or you can email me at bikekarmaguy at gmail.com. That's also the email if you have any comments, suggestions, want a pack of stickers sent to you absolutely free, or perhaps you want to talk about your product and if it would be a good fit for the show. Apart from the music, the Bike Karma Bicycle Stories podcast are the intellectual property of Tom Brown. All rights, including trademarks, copyrights, are asserted and reserved, including both my logos. Why do I have two logos? Because I've got two good ideas for a logo. Doesn't that create brand confusion? I I don't know. I hope not. One of them looks better on stickers, and the other one looks better as a little tile online. Huh. Sounds like you can't decide. Yup. Shout out to Frank Yo. The comedy special should hopefully be coming out in June, thanks to him giving a little infusion of inspiration there. So until then, keep it wheel. 